invite you to take out your Bibles. We'll be turning to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. I'm glad for an opportunity to stand before you in the pulpit this morning and, and to preach a lesson, but uh, I, I welcome you to follow along with the Scriptures as we go through this, this study this morning entitled The Devil's Playbook. And I invite you to look at the Scriptures because I always appreciate um, any honest feedback. And if there's anything that I deliver this morning, um, any, anything that you find to not be in alliance or in, in the pattern of the Word, I would invite you to, to come and, and let me know that and, and uh, have that discussion. I, I, I truly desire to only speak from the Word of God. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15 and 16 is where we'll take much of the thoughts of our study this morning. It says there, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. I present that this passage here gives us the devil's playbook. And what I mean by that, many of you may be familiar with an image that looks like this. And for those of you that are not football fans, you might be looking at that and thinking, what in the world is that diagram? What is that thing? Um, but those of you that are football fans probably recognize this as something out of a playbook. Um, you see, the O's represent the offensive players, the players that are trying, trying to drive the football down the field. The X's are representing the players that are trying to stop them from driving the football down the field. And, and this is something out of a playbook. Um, you know, the, the concept is that, although I don't want to make light with the, the analogy of a weighty matter of sin and, and of temptation, but the devil is our adversary. He is our opponent, and he is the one on offense. We are the one on defense, and we are trying to block the devil from having an effect on our lives. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 is, is a well-known passage where it talks about the devil being a roaring lion trying to seek to, seeking whom he may devour. Well, that, that passage also calls the devil our adversary. Um, once again, not to make light of it, but we think of you know, many of us in the, in the room may be Tennessee fans, right? You think of Alabama to your Tennessee. Or for me, I'm a Cubs fan. I think of the Cardinals to my Cubs. Um, that's the adversary. They're the, the enemy, the opponent. That is the devil. And the devil represents those O's that are, are seeking to, uh, to, to make us fall and falter. Well, the devil's, ad, you know, his playbook consists of what we looked at just a moment ago. The lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You know, before we even get, get into the meat of this lesson, I want to point out the devil has no, uh, no pull and cannot make us sin. The devil is not able to make us sin. The devil only can appeal to our own sinful nature and try to entice us to sin. So all those things that we see, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of the life, they, they are innate within us. The devil cannot make us sin, but the devil can appeal to our own sinful desire. You see, the devil's like the offensive coordinator. He's the one that, that draws up the plays that says, here we're going to pass, or here we're going to run the ball. Or he's like the manager in baseball that decides, we're going we're gonna to bunt here, or we're going to you know, try to squeeze a run in, or, or we're going to steal a base. That's what the devil is doing. And, and it's important for us to recognize that we are on defense and he is on offense. But it's not always extremely clear cut. And it's not cut and dried necessarily. Let's look at um, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 gives us a, uh, a listing of sins. Galatians 5 verses 19 to 21. 
gives us a listing of sins. What, the reason I say it's not always clear cut, it's, it's not that we can necessarily make three columns and say, okay, this sin applies to the pride of life. This sin applies to the lust of the flesh. It's not necessarily that cut and dry. These, these desires of man that the devil appeals to are overlapping in nature in many ways. However, this study, we're going to aim to try and dissect them and, and understand the differences between them and what makes them appealing to mankind. But it, just a, a warning up front, we couldn't necessarily take this list that we see here, um, you know, the, the adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, etc., etc., as we go on in this passage. It's not that we can divvy them up among three columns. So this morning, I do want to spend a, a few moments in each one and kind of understand what makes them unique, although they are overlapping. But the lust of the flesh, the, the, the term, to break it down initially, the term that's, that's used, that's, um, that's translated to the word lust, is the Greek word epithymia. Um, now, the interesting thing, as, as I've um, done some studying on, on what this Greek word is, is actually, um, what it actually, the intention behind the word is that it is a morally neutral word. The, the term that's, that's epithymia is actually just a simple meaning of something that has strong desire. The reason that we can know that for sure, there's actually passages that, um, that use the term epithymia in the Greek to be translated to something different and things that are, are of a positive nature. Um, Luke 22 and verses 15 and 16, for instance, um, when Jesus is about to depart from the disciples, he says, Then he said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. When he says, I have desired, it's using that same Greek word, epithymia. Um, same when, when Paul is, is writing to the Philippian brethren in Philippians 1, verse 23. He says, For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Those are instances that are using this term epithymia. It, it means a, a deep and intense and strong desire is simply what the first half of this, the lust of the flesh so, so the, the um, inherent evil of the lust of the flesh doesn't actually come until you get to the part of the phrase that is the flesh. But um, the, the lust of the flesh, we can understand, is, is it's the desire to give in to what we believe will feel good. Um, and I'll go ahead and, and draw the contrast now between the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, although the eyes are a part of our fleshly nature. Um, I believe the contrast, and what we'll see more as we define the lust of the eyes in a moment, but it is that the lust of the flesh is that, that which we believe will feel good, and the lust of the eyes is that which we see that looks good. So it's, it's, it's very similar in nature, and perhaps we're drawing uh, or splitting hairs a little bit between the two because they are so overlapping. Um, but what I think we can see is that it's, it's our, our human nature, or almost our, um, the flesh is, is our desire, almost toward our, our animal instinct of doing what would feel good and, and would be what would keep us alive and keep us going physically. James chapter 1 and verses 14 and 15, go ahead and turn with me there. James chapter 1 and verses 14 and 15 says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. That when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. See, I think this, this passage applies to really any of the three. As I mentioned before, the devil cannot force us into sin. All he can do is, is find what is our own desires and entice us. But I think this passage most strongly um, fits in with the lust of the flesh. That which feels good, that is our, our desire, what we think will uh, in, be enticing to us. But there's other passages that tell us that we need to be choosing whether where we're going to walk, whether we're going to walk in the flesh or walk in the Spirit. Romans chapter 8, 
uh, verses 1 through 3. Romans 8, verses 1 through 3 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So that verse 1 um, draws that, that contrast between those walking in the flesh and those walking in the Spirit. As we mentioned, the, the flesh uh, as a part of that phrase is really where that, um, the sinful nature comes in, is with the flesh. And then let's continue on in verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh... God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. And that verse 3 right there calls it, um, you know, puts the words directly together. Sinful flesh. Flesh and the nature of our very flesh and giving into that that is carnal. Giving into that that is physically enticing. Um, that which we desire that we think would feel good. Um, is giving in to the flesh that is sinful. Galatians 5 and verse 16 says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Once again, showing that contrast between the walking in the Spirit and walking in the flesh. And then skipping ahead in that same passage there to verse 24, it says, And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. See, those, those that are desiring to walk in the Spirit have to crucify, put to death the desires of the flesh because we'll either be walking in one or walking in the other. Either walking in the Spirit or walking in the flesh. You know, this lust of the flesh is often a perversion of really what God created and intended for good. You think of lust of the flesh that as it comes to marriage and intimacy and sexual sins that are of fornication and adultery, um, the lust of the flesh is, is, that, is really a perversion of what God intended to be a blessing. Or also, God created the fruit of the vine that we could, that we could use for really for, um, for pleasure of drink. But that has been... Um, that has been perverted as well as, as it's gone through fermentation and people have created strong and intoxicating drink out of it. You see, a lot of times those, those lust of the flesh type of sins are really a perversion of something that God always intended to be a blessing. Now, as I've already alluded to, um, the lust of the eyes plays a slight different role, and that is that um, it's more of a desire based on something that looks good. Um, may, maybe we're not thinking of it as um, something that we, we believe would feel good, but something we believe would, would look enviable, something that looks good. Um, looking into the, the Thayer's lexicon of this phrase, the lust of the eyes, um, it, it sounds relatively simple and remedial, but one of the phrases that it uses to describe the lust of the eyes is a desire that is excited by seeing. And while that sounds re relatively um, simple, as you kind of dive deeper into that, what, what the meaning behind it is, the, the context is really that it's talking about envy. It's talking about covetousness, um, desiring what someone else may have that, that we don't have, or desiring something that we, we crave or that we want. We see something and our eye tells us, I want that. Um, that is, is, to me, how we kind of understand the difference between the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. You see, it's enti enticement for what looks desirable. So as we, as we look at a couple of passages that I think really play into the concept of the lust of the eyes, um, we can talk about those things that are envious, those sins that are of covetous, of, of that nature, so let's look at Luke chapter 16 <clears throat> and verse 13. Luke chapter 16 and verse 13. It says there, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. 
And in this context, that serving God and mammon, it's talking about serving God. And then on the other context, it's, it's serving um, physical wealth and physical blessings, um, monetary nature. Um, it's, you cannot be serving both masters. And when we have the envious nature that bubbles up out of us and we, we desire something that we see, that we crave, and we covet, then it's trying to serve the other master rather than serving God. There's also a parable that we want to look at this morning. Luke chapter 12. Go ahead and be turning to Luke chapter 12. <clears throat> and right at verse 15, it starts out and, and, and Jesus says to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Right there, before he even introduces the parable, he introduces it by saying, take heed, watch out for covetousness, and, and desiring the, you know, the abundance of the things that you possess. And then verse 16 continues on with the parable that we refer to as the parable of the rich fool. It says, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, <clears throat> What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Very similar to what we were talking about a moment ago is, is if you're walking in the, the flesh, you're not walking in the Spirit. Very similarly, are we rich toward God or are we rich toward our physical belongings and our possessions? Where is our treasure? You see, this man, the rich fool, was laying up his treasure on physical things that would sustain himself physically as opposed to understanding what would sustain himself spiritually and would lead to a spiritual life of eternity. But yet he was more concerned with storing up food and storing up belongings to protect his physical self. The same thing can be said about being envious or coveting those that are physical belongings. Um, and I can't help but think about an example of, of Joseph's brothers as I think about the lust of the eyes. You know, thinking about the covetous nature where they coveted their brother Joseph because he had that coat of many colors that demonstrated that he was, um, was the chosen of, his, of their father, um, that he was the, the favorite of their father. And they coveted. They saw that with their eyes. They saw what Joseph had that they did not have. And it led them down a path of sin because of their covetousness, because of that envying of their brother. So then I want to look at the third of the devil's playbook, and that is the pride of life. This one, I, I believe this one is the most broad, maybe the most difficult to define um, because of the broad nature. And I think many, many, many sins fall under a category of pride, being at the root of that sin. But what is pride? In, in some senses, pride is... Simply put, thinking too highly of oneself. And I think it, it goes a little bit deeper because I think it's not just our own self-view, but I think it's also what our desire is for how others view us as well. I think pride is, is not just that we think too highly of ourselves, but we want others around us to think highly of us as well. And it's, it's a, a prideful thing to be more concerned with our reputation than our character. Um, that, is, that is, I think, the, the root of pride, is wanting our reputation to be good and not caring necessarily about our character that creates a real reputation of goodness. So that, that pride can lead to many, many sinful things, as I alluded to. Um, some, just as, for some examples, pride could lead to a lack of repentance, you see, if, if someone has sin in their life, they first have to admit to themselves that they have sin in their life. 
And if someone is thinking too highly of themselves, then they will not humble themselves to the point of recognizing the sin in their very lives. That even could go into a public nature. If someone has a sin in their life that, that's widely known, you know, someone has, has perhaps been living in adultery for, for years and years, and their reputation is more important to them, and so they will, they will choose to continually live in sin rather than to come to a state of repentance. You know, also I think that uh, another sin that pride can lead us to is simply someone in the world not desiring God. You see, someone, I, I talked a, a couple weeks ago in an invitation about being wise in, in our own eyes as opposed to drawing our wisdom from God. And, um, you know, simply being wise in one's own eyes is, is thinking too highly of oneself once again, almost thinking... I know things better than God knows things. And that pride can simply lead many away from God. There's many in the world today that simply have no desire for a relationship with God because of the pride that they have attached so deeply and rooted in their lives. Now, pride can lead us to sins against our brethren as well. When someone, we feel that someone has done wrong to us, and rather than simply discussing it with them and, and working through that, we harbor anger or hatred toward a person because we think that, that they're thinking lowly of us when we think that they ought to think highly of us. Um, that pride can lead to anger, hatred. It can lead to lying as well. You know, protecting our reputation at all costs, even if it means shading or, you know, hiding the truth. Um, or covering up the truth because we don't want others to think more lowly of us. It can lead to so many sins, that pride of life. Proverbs, um, time and time again, warns us about pride. We're going to look at a few of the Proverbs where it discusses pride. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 7 says, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. And Proverbs 11 and verse 2 says, When pride comes, then comes shame. But the humble is wisdom. But with the humble is wisdom. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 10 says, By pride comes nothing but strife. But with the well advised is wisdom. And then Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. This isn't an exhaustive list list of the Proverbs discussing pride by any means, but those are a few passages that I think that really get to the heart of how pride is warned against and how pride can lead to many terrible things in our lives. The worst of it being sin. And um, that last one we said, you know, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall, tells me just when someone thinks, I've made it. I've made everything that I want to be in my life, but they've forgotten God. That pride, that lack of, of a humble spirit and a humble heart is what happens right before the fall. So those are, are the devil's plays. You know, as it, actually, as it said um, when we read 1 John, um, it said, for all that is in the world. That's all. That's all there is. That's all that the devil has, is he has those plays in his book. Just those three. Now, he uses those three. He uses them relentlessly. And I want to look at a few examples where he has used those. Some in particular, uh, in, or in particular, where they were very effective. For instance, Eve was tempted in the garden. The devil came to Eve in the form of a serpent and tempted her in the garden. Go ahead and turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. Um, you can follow along in Genesis chapter 3. We won't spend too long dissecting each of the verses, but let's just discuss. We know the story of, of Eve in the garden. And you see, she saw the fruit that was from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. She saw it. She coveted it. She had envy. She wanted to eat of it. And the devil appealed to that very nature 
that she coveted that fruit. And he said, it's good for food. It'll feel good for you to eat that. It'll feel good for you to eat of that fruit of the knowledge of, of, of good and evil. And, and then he also appealed to her pride as well, did he not? He appealed to her pride saying, surely when you eat of this, you'll not die, but you'll have knowledge and wisdom in the same way that God has knowledge and wisdom. You see, the devil in the garden appealed to all three of these deep-rooted human nature characteristics. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This isn't the only example that we see of really all three being used by the devil and being successful. We see David, the story with David, Bathsheba, and Uriah in 2 Samuel chapter 11. You see, David saw a woman bathing. He saw it. He coveted. He had envy in his heart. He had desire that was enticed by his seeing. And then he lay with her and, and did what he, he gave in to that lust of the flesh. And then because of his pride and because of his, uh, his prideful nature and wanting to protect his reputation sent Uriah off knowing he would die in battle because it was better to do that and to give in further into sin because of his previous sin and covering that sin up, sent Uriah off knowing he would die in battle because it was protecting his reputation. It was, he was filled with pride at the time. He thought so highly of himself and he wanted the others around him not to know of his lowly, sinful actions. And so he covered it up. All three of the devil's plays were at play in that very story. But they don't always work. The devil's plays do not always work. Turn with me to Matthew 4. We will spend a little bit more time looking at Matthew chapter 4. Because Jesus was also tempted in all three ways. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is tempted three times in the wilderness by the devil. Now, first of all, um, verse 2 tells us that Jesus had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And it says, afterward, he was hungry. That's probably an understatement. He would absolutely have been hungry. He was physically hungry. And the tempter, the, the devil himself, the tempter came to him, verse 3, and said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Jesus had a, a physical need. He was hungry. He needed food to sustain his physical being. And the devil knew that and took advantage of that and tempted him to give in by doing what would be filling the lust of the flesh or the desire of the flesh. I would say, you know, we talked about that word epithymia, um, that lust. It was a pretty strong desire of Jesus at the time to eat. And yet he was able to withstand the devil and withstand the lust of the flesh and was able to uh, was able to withstand that temptation. <clears throat> the next of the, the temptations, the devil comes to him and, and takes him up to the pinnacle of the temple and says to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You see, even the devil is using Scripture against, against Jesus and telling him, you're the son of God. If you throw yourself down, his angels will come and, and swoop you up and, and protect you. Appealing to Jesus' status, his reputation, his, um, his very divine nature. Appealing to the fact that Jesus is the highest of high as far as human beings are concerned. And he's appealing to that, telling Jesus, you could throw yourself down and you'd be fine because the angels would come and, and take care of you. He's appealing to the pride of life within Jesus. 
And then the third of the temptations that happens here, he takes him up, verse 8, on an exceedingly high mountain, and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down <clears throat> and worship, him, worship me. Why does the devil take him on an exceedingly high mountain? He takes him there so he could see all that was around, all the kingdoms in the surrounding area. The devil wanted him to see those things. You see, he was appealing to the lust of the eyes. All of this, all of this physical kingdom can be yours. Um, you see, Jesus is the one, God is the one that rules in the kingdoms of men. But the devil has some play. In the physical realm, the devil has some play. The devil, in a sense, is over the physical aspect of the kingdom. You see, God is over the, the spiritual aspect. God is, is truly the king of all. And, and Jesus is the king of all kings in a spiritual nature. But the devil has some play in the physical realm, does he not? And the devil is offering all that to Jesus. Saying, here is all the kingdoms. You can see it all. Don't you want it? Do you envy it? Do you covet it? Because I have it. And I can give it to you if you just simply uh, renounce God. And if you fall down and worship me. He's appealing to the lust of the eyes. In all three instances, Jesus withstood and did not falter into sin. And I want to look at a few more thoughts about temptation in general. We've talked a lot about temptation this morning. Um, but let's, let's talk about temptation just a little bit more. First of all, temptation itself is not a sin. How do we know? Well, Jesus himself was tempted. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Temptation itself cannot be a sin if Jesus himself was tempted, because we know that Jesus is our high priest who is without sin, who never gave in to sin, who is never giving in to temptation as we do. So temptation itself is not a sin. Um, and then turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 13. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 gives us a couple of really great things to to think about when it comes to temptation and very comforting thoughts. This is one of, um, one of my all-time favorite passages of Scripture. And it says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. We see two things. We see, first of all, um, in this passage, we're told no temptation will befall you that's not common to man. You see, we can always find someone else who's gone through a similar temptation. Once again, there's only three plays. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And when we boil the sins down, we find those at play. In all of them, we find them at play. And we can, and we will, if we look for it, we can find others who have had similar temptations. No temptation is uncommon, and all have been common to man. But the other thing that we see in this verse is that God always provides a way of escape. He will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able to bear. And he makes a way of escape unto us. Then the other thing that I want to point out, James chapter 4 and verse 7 James chapter 4 and verse 7 says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. To me, this is one of the most important things that we can understand. If we resist, if we do not give in to the devil's plays, and we defeat him, he will flee. What an amazing thought, understanding that if we, give in, if we don't give in and we are headstrong for God, and we're headstrong against sin and against temptation, the devil will flee us. Now, that's not to say that he'll never come back and try to tempt us again. Certainly, he'll come back. He'll keep coming. But if we resist him, he will flee. We can make the devil go away. 
So then lastly, I want to look at how do we create our own playbook? How do we create a defense that is able to withstand the devil so that he will flee? Well, the first thing I want to talk about in any sport, the most important thing for an athlete to do is stay alert. Staying alert is so important. You know, I think about when I was in Little League playing, you know, Little League baseball and was playing in the outfield. And, you know, the coach always would tell us, stay alert. Now, we may not have had a ball hit to us for three games. You know, it's not often in Little League that a, a batter hits the ball out of the infield. We may be so bored in the outfield that we're looking down at the grass and we see, oh, hey, look, there's a dandelion. And we're, we're, we're missing the fact that the ball is about to be hit directly to us. We didn't stay alert. So the, the first thing that an athlete needs to do is to stay alert, not get caught daydreaming. It's important that we do not forget about the existence of the devil. Because I guarantee you, he has not forgotten about our existence. Although we cannot physically see the devil, you know, he doesn't have a, a physical form that we can look at him and, and that's not the way it works. And so because he doesn't have a physical body or a physical nature, it's easy to forget about his existence. I warn you, don't forget about the devil because he's not forgetting about you. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 um, we already alluded to this when we talked about the devil being our adversary, but it says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He is seeking whom he may devour. And it tells us to be sober, be vigilant. We always need to have a watchful eye for the devil, and we need to always stay a step ahead of the devil. The other thing, um, you know, in any sport... Um, as we look at, I mean, you could honestly apply this to any sport, is the importance of positioning yourself well. Um, you know, all those O's and X's that we looked at are all about positioning the offensive and the defensive players and applying the, the correct number of linemen to the line and the right number of cornerbacks to guard against the wide receivers and so on and so forth. Um, but positioning yourself well is extremely, uh, you know, applicable to our spiritual being as well. Um, consider, you know, are we going to put ourselves in a precarious situation being with people that we know are going to an environment where there will be sin? You know, are we going to position ourselves next to them, whether it be the job that we take and we put ourselves in a, in a state where we are often tempted? You know, are we going to position ourselves with a best friend that you know, he, has, he or she has filthy language and, and talks about things that they ought not to be talking about. And we, we put up with it over and over again and we continue to position ourselves around that person. You know, are we going to, to choose to um, commit to a marriage with someone who does not share our same values? It's all about, you know, positioning ourselves well with those around us. That is such a crucial thing. Um, you know, and, it, and it's so effective in sports. Um, I don't know how many of you are, are close baseball followers, but there's a thing in baseball that's called the shift. And basically where the defense is shifted, where they're, they put more players on one side of the infield be, than the other. And they do this because they know their opponent. They know this, this batter only hits the ball to this side of the infield. And so they put all the players over there. As a matter of fact, it is so effective in baseball, positioning them well, that they're getting rid of it. This offseason, they're saying, no more, that's not allowed. Next year, there's no shift allowed. And it's so effective. Positioning yourself well is so effective in, in sports. And, and it's just as effective for us in our spiritual life. We need to position ourselves well. Um, well, before I get to, to trusting our teammates, certainly we need to do that as well. We need to know our own strengths and weaknesses. And I think that, that allies with the, the concept of positioning ourselves well. If we have a nature that is, you know, something in particular is maybe, let's say, our sin of choice. Our sin that we fall to more often than others. Um, are we going to position ourselves knowing that that's our weakness? Or are we going to stay within what we know is our strength? Um, you know, 
Linebackers and wide receivers are shaped a little differently, aren't they? We're not going to take a wide receiver who is, you know, a, a small, fast runner and, and put him on the line and expect him to go up against the 300 pounders um, that are coming in with all muscular strength and, and all the force of the linemen. That doesn't make sense. We need a position based on our strengths and our weaknesses. Same thing can be said for our spiritual lives. And then we need to trust our, te our teammates. How do we do that? Well, we, we align ourselves with Christians, and we need to trust our brothers and sisters in Christ. We do that by being here at, at assembly, by coming to church, worshiping God with, with our brothers and sisters. We have spiritual discussions with one another. You know, it, it, it gets um, beyond um, a simple, hello, how are you? Hope you have a good week to... You know, what's going on in your life? And, and tell me about your walk with God. And let's have a spiritual discussion together so that we can truly support one another as a team. Um, it, a, a game of football is not won by one person. It takes a full team working together. If the quarterback only has one second from the time the ball is snapped to the time he's going to throw the football because the line is non-existent, then that, t that quarterback cannot win a game. You know, no matter how good he is at throwing a football, he'll never have a chance to. Um, we need a team. We need to surround ourselves with a team, having spiritual discussions, going to church, and then even deeper, confessing sins to one another. How do we combat pride and thinking too highly of ourselves and, and only wanting other people to think highly of us as well? It's by practicing humility letting one another know our shortcomings. And when we do, we can, we can truly open up to one another. And they may open up to us in return so that we can truly share in one another's burdens. Galatians chapter uh, 6 and verse 2 says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We need to be sharing in our walk together. You know, our spiritual discussions need to be happening. Um, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2 even says, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Now that's not to say that we can't, uh, you know, have a discussion about something that, you know, maybe a common or a shared interest like a football game. Um, you know, we can have common interests and, and have physical, you know, conversations about things of the world, but we need to make sure that we are setting our mind on things above. And that goes for us in our individual walks, but also in our relationships with our brothers and sisters. Um, we have another teammate and is the most powerful teammate we can have. Of course, that's our Lord. God can be our teammate, but we only really communicate with God when we're praying. We communicate with our teammate in God when we're praying. Matthew 26 and verse 41 says, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. How do we combat against temptation and against the devil's plays in his playbook? Through prayer. When we are praying to God in heaven, it helps us lest we enter into temptation. And then also studying the word diligently. Consider Jesus and how he overcame those temptations. Every time he overcame a temptation, we read in Matthew 4, he did so using scripture. The scripture was so ingrained in his heart and in his mind that it, it was so simple, maybe, uh, maybe not so simple, but it was his way of overcoming that temptation to quote scripture. It, it was simple for him to recall the scripture because he knew it so well, meaning he had spent time in study. We need to spend time studying the Word because that is how God communicates back to us. We pray to Him. We read His Word. We have a relationship with our teammate in God. That is our defensive playbook. It's understanding that these temptations are real. But the devil cannot make us to sin. All he can do is appeal to our own desires and try to entice us toward the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. So one of the hardest things I think about serving God is that we always have to be on defense. You know, not only against the devil, it's against ourselves. Because once again, um, 
that is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. They are within us. We need to always be on defense against ourselves. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24, Christ tells us that we must deny ourselves. Well, that is how we overcome those temptations. It's to give up the flesh, to give up that that we, we desire with our eyes, and to give up our pride of life for humility. We must do this to reach heaven. So I ask you this morning, are you on defense? If you're not on defense, you need to make a change in your life to start battling against the devil to overcome him. Your teammates can help you. The Christians around you, those in this very room, are here to support you. And God is your teammate who's waiting with open arms to welcome you. If you've never become a Christian and need to do so today, or if your life is not in the right place with the Lord, the invitation is extended to you this very morning to come forward as we stand and as we sing.